Welcome to Mathematical Image Processing exercise number nine. Today we want to have a look at denoising, well, a topic that we have been working on very intensively in the last weeks and with a different technique today, which are variational methods. Variational methods are, um, well, like procedures that try to minimize a given functional in order to uh, denoise uh, an image. So the solution uh, to the denoising problem here will always be given as, the, uh, as a solution to a minimization problem. And this minimization takes place in, well, in certain special function spaces. So recall from the very first lectures that we had that images are always considered to be functions. So we reduce the class of available functions for us by considering uh, LP spaces. And um, we also introduced further spaces that are the so-called Sobolev spaces. And Sobolev spaces carry some sort of regularity and smoothness that we also want our image to have after denoising. Therefore, it's very natural uh, when you look at denoising problems like the one that we want to cover today, that the space that our functional works on or lives on is a, is a Sobolev space like here, the space H1. So maybe before we dive in to this exercise, uh, I want to give you a little bit uh, intuition or a different way to see uh, those Sobolev spaces H1. Uh, so you may have heard that it's, it has something to do with uh, the derivative being integrable in a sense uh, yeah, that it's in L2, for example. So in order to write down a term like this, we, uh, we also need integrability of our derivative, but um, I feel that this is, uh, well, it's, it's hard to get as a concept, yeah, because um, normally a function that you have, you can just take a first derivative and with Sobolev functions in H1, it's a little bit different. So um, I brought with me today a, a little theorem um, that we don't, don't want to prove here, it comes from a book that is also, I think, linked in the reference of our lecture notes, which is from Predis and Lorenz. It's also in an English version available, Mathematical Image Processing. And um, there we get a characterization of a function being a Sobolev function, being an HK. So in our case, um, we are in the case K equals to one. So let's just assume K is equal to one. And so the theorem tells us a function is in H1 of RD. Yeah, and now comes a nice characterization with respect to the Fourier transform, which is another operator that we have known um, in, the, in the past weeks. And it tells us that uh, if I take the two norm of the Fourier transform of U and I multiply it with one plus xi to the two, which is, so xi is just the argument um, that we have here. Uh, and this is finite. Yeah, then this is an equivalent condition. So how can we read an, um, a characterization like this? So characterizations are always good in order to get some intuition on what is happening, an intuition on what a Sobolev function should be. So here we have weak derivatives. Yeah, and weak derivatives, you can think about it as a, a generalized version to say that something is smooth. Yeah, so um, like generalized smoothness. Ah, so you cannot take derivatives in the usual sense, but um, the more derivatives you can take, the smoother your function gets. Yeah. So this is this about intuition for for derivatives and smoothness. On the right hand side, we have we do not have derivatives at all. But you may recall from some of the 
uh, rules we, uh, we learned about the Fourier transform, that there is um, taking the derivative of um, a Fourier transform is, is like multiplying with a polynomial. And this is what why, why this term here comes into play. And, but there is no derivative. Yeah? So having an integral, an infinite integral, so we integrate over the whole space, having an integral like this uh, as a finite number means that our function u, or well, the whole integrand needs to decay fast enough. Yeah, because if the if the function does not decay fast enough, the, we will we will be um, we will have still a lot of area to cover below our function that will also have our integral blow up. So if we have a function that decays fast enough, then the integral will be finite. So this is about intuition for LP spaces. Yeah. So now we can trade in generalized smoothness for a decay property of the Fourier transform. And of course, this only works in L2 spaces because there we have uh, a lot of nice properties for the Fourier transform. So roughly speaking, to sum up, weak derivatives are reflected by rapid decay. And we can take a look at some examples to see um, what this decay means. Uh, so I brought uh, with me some, some examples of functions and their corresponding Fourier transform, or at least um, real value. Uh, okay, so it's a symmetric function, so this is the, the Fourier transform is already real. So in here we have the Fourier transform that you already know. So here on the, the first function is just our um, indicator function and we have the sync function there. And this function does not decay fast enough. So in fact, the decay that we have here is uh, more or less proportional to one over, uh, one over xi. Yeah, and so when I multiply this, with uh, a polynomial like this one, um, it, it won't be integrable anymore. And this is reflected by the fact that uh, this function here, okay, we know it's not differentiable in the classical sense, but it's also not differentiable in the weak sense. Now, this is where we can, for example, see that a function that does not decay fast enough, well, is not weakly differentiable. Uh, a function whose Fourier transform does not decay fast enough. In the second equation, we have a very classical example. Um, it's more or less uh, the exponential of minus x squared. Yeah. So note that this is the function with some prefactors that uh, does not change when we take the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform is also uh, more or less the exponential of minus x squared. So we have now something that decays exponentially and multiplying something that decays exponentially with a polynomial is still decaying very fast. And therefore we get here a very smooth function. The last example I brought with me is uh, the function one over one x squared. Yeah, it's also uh, smooth, but, uh, and if we take a look at the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform is something like exp of minus uh, yeah, oh, I should use the variable psi here. So, and now let us look at the last example a little bit differently. So, assume that this is the Fourier transform of, um, of this function here. And we can see it does not decay fast enough. So, 1 over 1 plus x squared, if I multiply it, with one plus the um, absolute value of psi squared, it uh, it will will not have a finite integral. Yeah, so this integral here will not be uh, solvable or it will not be finite. And if we take a closer look, so I hope you can see this, or maybe I zoom in a little bit more. Um, well, you can also guess from the function definition that this function is not differentiable. It's not smooth in this in here. Yeah, this comes from the absolute value. 
So we have a function that seems that seems to decay. Um, well, nicely. Well, it decays. It goes to zero. This is what we get from here, but it does not decay fast enough. So um, the Fourier transform of it is not. Um, so if this is the Fourier transform of uh, omega hat, then well, uh, omega hat cannot be differentiable, and it's not differentiable here. Okay, so far for a little bit of intuition. So I think I'm going to switch now, leave this intuition uh, visible for you for some time. And we now start by looking at uh, the exercise. Uh, because the exercise now starts with um, a function, a functional phi that takes now we have a little bit of intuition. It takes functions of H1, so functions functions whose Fourier transform decays fast enough, and it calculates the following. So maybe I, I write it down a little bit differently. So phi phi of a function u. So u is an element of H1. So so will that function? is defined as one half times, now we have here a so-called data term. And if I look closely at it, it's just taking the two norm or well, the distance of an initial image u0 minus u. So this is the L2 norm of this one. And this is our so-called data term. And the second part is lambda halves times the two norm of the gradient of u. So we now know how to interpret this gradient. This gradient, well, it comes from um, the fact that we have a, this is a weak derivative in here. Yeah, so, and this is our regularizer or penalizer. Yeah, and we need both terms in our functional because the data term gives us consistency, which you can interpret as closeness to the original data. Yeah, of course. So if I plug in for you my original image u zero, then the data term gets zero, and I have a perfect uh, approximation of my first image. Yeah, I just I just take the original image, but then the penalizer may be, may get really big if I have a lot of noise in my image and the gradients are big. So I also want this term to be small, and this well, the smaller it gets, the smoother my data is. All right, so now I want to minimize this. And the intuition of minimizing is that hopefully in order to for phi, for phi of u to be minimal, um, both terms will be small. Yeah, of course, the sum of two small uh, numbers gives me another small number. And uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, this here is always a real number. So it makes sense to talk about phi of u being big or small. Yeah, this is why we always take norms. And this is also why we always take for lambda a real number. Yeah, so we can really calculate something. This is like measuring um, how good our new image u will be. In the lecture, I think you learned already one way to um, to translate the problem of minimizing this function to um, solving a partial differential equation via the uh, Euler-Lagrange method. Today, um, we want to, well, more or less quickly go through the direct approach, which is not very um, handy because it's a lot of work, it's a lot of calculation, but um, 
we get the same result in the end. So we um, we will we will see that this this minimizer u prime can be given as the convolution of our original image with a kernel, and this convolution um, in some sense corresponds to solving a, a differential equation. But we may get into detail with this um, on uh, at another time. So today we want to solve this directly, and um, in the exercise part A, uh, we reformulate our functional um, using the Fourier transform. And you you can already guess why uh, using a Fourier transform is is a good idea here, because it helps us to get rid of um, well uh, weak derivatives that uh, are hard to handle if we are in a um, yeah, if we don't know what the function is that we are looking for. And uh, so using Parseval's identity or the theorem of Parseval, this is something why these spaces L2 are so helpful to us. It tells us that the L2 norm does not change once we take um, once we take the Fourier transform. So then let's do it. Um, so I have already rewritten this as two norms. So we can now use Parseval to rewrite the data term as being just the two norm of the Fourier transform of u0 minus the Fourier transform of u. So of course, this is also a two norm. If I'm in H1, then in particular, the gradient of u is an element of L2. This is one of the definitions that we have for weak derivatives. So uh, for L2 functions, I can use Parseval's theorem again and derive the following equation. Uh, so now I have just written Fourier transforms in front of everything. And so while the first term cannot be simplified anymore, the second term, for the second term, we can use uh, a rule that we have for um, uh, for the Fourier transforms and gradients or partial derivatives. And let me recall this rule. Ah, so maybe I'll leave this here on. Um, so recall that the gradient of u is something like the first derivative of u up to the uh, derivative of in the dth direction, and then the derivative, let's say, in the first direction of u, the Fourier transform of it is given as i, the imaginary unit, times xi1 f of u. OK. So and then now, of course, if I do this for every um, partial derivative, I get out the vector. And then for the vector, I can just write the norm of this vector at xi is just the norm of xi. So xi is also, it's also a vector times f of u at xi. And I need to square this one as well. Uh, so, OK. This comes from the two norm here. Um, yeah, so plugging in this calculation here, let me maybe also show you this one here on the left hand side. You can scroll down here a little. So plugging this in gives me one half f of u0 minus f of u, so this term does not change, plus lambda halves times um, xi squared uh, f of u in the 2 norm. Right, writing this again as an integral, I can take all, all well, recall that those are just integrals. I get the integral over Rd of 1 half times the Fourier transform of u0 at position xi 
minus the Fourier transform of u at position psi to the 2 plus lambda halves psi squared. Um, f of u of psi squared here. Ah, so maybe it did here a little mistake. So, so this should still be in here. Now I get it also under the integral. I hope it's still readable. And I, then I integrate over d psi. All right, so why, why the, the trouble of reformulating our original problem to this new one. We can now change a little bit the strategy because recall that we are looking for a function that minimizes our functional. So finding a function means we need to have something that is defined for every uh, real position in our space R of D. Now we have the uh, comfortable situation that we have here a function or the Fourier transform of a function defined at every point. So we can change our strategy to finding an in integrand um, that minimizes, uh, that, that is minimal, and then also the integral will get minimal in our, in our uh, example here. So, uh, so the idea is now to minimize the integrand. Yeah, so we can forget about the integral and just look at the function that remains under the integral here. So this is also uh, what the problem now tells us. So if, once we have reformulated our original phi of u, um, well, using Parseval and some properties of the Fourier transform, we come now to the point that um, we may assume that it suffices to find a function or a Fourier transform of a function that minimizes the integrand. So this one I have just copied here. This is the integrand as above. So, and we want to minimize this integrand at each point psi in R of D. So this, this way we will find uh, f of u at each point psi. So we will define the full return sum of the function that we are looking at. And we are, so now here I have written down the definition again of our minimizer. So f of u prime, the function that we are looking for, will be the value, the complex value z that minimizes the integrand. So this is how you, you need to read this definition here. So what we are going to do now is, well, as we are just looking for complex numbers, z, well, we just substitute f u of psi by a complex number z. Also this guy we substitute by z. And we are now looking at a, well, slightly easier minimization problem because now we have just a function that depends on a complex variable and we now want to find its minimum. Yeah, so the only problem is how do we handle the complexity of the function? So um, if you never have minimized something complex before, it's maybe, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's a little bit strange to do that. And so the idea here is we, uh, We want to uh, minimize this real valued function yeah, because I, I take absolute values, so I get out something real. And in order to minimize this, we, we decompose our variable, our complex variable z into the absolute value times the uh, complex signum function of z. And so this decomposition is not, uh, is not very, um, it's not a very special decomposition. Uh, when you look at the 
definition of the signum of Z. For complex arguments, it's just Z by the absolute value of Z for Z not zero. Yeah, and then, of course, if I uh, multiply signum of Z of Z with the absolute value of Z, I just get out Z, which is the definition that um, that we use for our decomposition here. So I'm not sure how we are doing with in, uh, if we are able to do this in time. Therefore, I'm I think I'm just going to, uh, to accelerate a little bit. So we can still finish this exercise. So um, ah, so I also need this is not the part that we want to do first. So we first um, want to rewrite the function that we want to minimize now using this decomposition. And this looks, of course, like a complicated expression, but um, it should not be too hard in order to uh, derive this once you plug in uh, this decomposition. And I think this is something that we still should do in detail. Um, let us look, take a look at the first part here. So and some, some of the ideas hopefully uh, get through uh, on, on what we are doing here. So if we take f of u0 of psi minus z to the 2, then as this is a complex number, or as the argument of this absolute value is a complex number, we can rewrite it by just saying, well, it's just f of u0 of psi minus z times the complex conjugate, f of u0 of psi minus z. So I take the complex conjugate of this one. and um, now, if we, if we solve this product, we get the sum of four terms. The first term is f of u0 of psi to the 2. This is the one I get when I multiply this one with its complex conjugate. Then I get minus z f of u0 of psi complex conjugate. This is the one uh, when I multiply minus z with the complex conjugate of the Fourier transform. Then I get z squared to the 2 and minus z bar of f of u0 of psi with a similar argument. So you just need to match up the right terms here. So and if we reorder these values, I, th I hope can already see some of the expressions that we have here. So we get out f of u0 of psi to the 2 plus, um, so why why do I, did I write it like this? Don't think this makes sense. Um, It just should just be z to the 2. So, and adding, so maybe I should highlight those two. So, adding up those two gives me two times the real value. So, minus two times the real value of z times f of u0 of psi bar. All right, and now I think the last simplification. So this one, first term stays as it is, as it is. The second one as well. And for the third term, I used the definition of the signum function, as you see it here, to derive um, two times z times the real value of the signum of z f of u zero of psi. So hopefully this, this is not too much magic happening here. 
let us take a look at what at what is different so we see what what uh, what the idea was so we have a z here and we know that we want to rewrite z using this decomposition so i can just do this rewriting z as signum of z times the absolute value and as the absolute value is always a real number i can just take it out of um, the real part and arrive at this result here. So now um, what I did not copy down was the one half in front of this term. So let me edit it maybe here the first equation and we also get it here then here and one half here one half and also here. And if we take a look at what we what we have here so we already find this part and we also find this part so and now with a similar um, similar argument ah okay and sorry we also find this part here so the only part missing is um, one half times um, lambda psi squared absolute value of z squared but this one is not really missing it has been there for the whole time so we did not even have to change this part and we now have rewritten this equation like this and even though it may seem more complicated than before um, it's now easier to take derivatives from this equation with respect to the absolute value or the signum function. So and now you just need to recall things that you already know from multivariable calculus or even from school. Because minimizing a function always means taking a derivative and setting this derivative to zero to get the necessary condition. And if we have this function here, depending on the signum and on the absolute value, well, if we take the derivative with respect to the signum, um, we get and set it to zero, we get our first necessary condition. So this is one of the conditions that we need to, to, to meet up here. So, and if we plug this, so this necessary condition for the signum back into 555 um, we we should now also f be able to find an appropriate um, value for the absolute value that minimizes our original uh, function here so how how does this work well just as before we take derivatives so what we need to do is we take the derivative of equation uh, 555. I'm not sure if it's the same um, in the lecture notes, so I think it's better if I just copy uh, this equation here. Of this equation, um, with respect to the absolute value of z, and set it to zero. So, and what does it mean to take a derivative with respect to uh, something that looks as strange as an absolute value of a complex number? Um, this means, well, just consider the um, this well this new variable as um, well as as a, as a variable that does not have any any arguments for itself. So, just think of this here as being a variable x. Same happens with this guy here. Just think of it as being a variable x. And then we can really easily calculate um, a derivative here because we just have one half of one plus, oh, let me write this in another color, one half lambda psi squared of our variable x plus one half f of u zero 
of xi squared, so we notice this term does not even depend on our variable x, minus x times the real value of signum of z, and so on. So, and if we now take the derivative with respect to x of this term, oh, sorry, this should be x squared, of course, because it's the absolute value of z to the 2. And if I take now a derivative here, this should get this this should now be really easy because the derivative of x squared is just 2x so i get out 1 plus lambda xi squared times x okay well this guy here gets zero because it does not depend on x at all and this other term just gives me the factor after the x which is the real value of the signum of f0 f of u0 times xi. Perfect. And so the first part was taking the derivative. The second part is setting it to 0. So this means the expression that we just derived should be equal to 0. Let us maybe also use, ah, it's still visible here, let us also use this condition here. So the signum of z is nothing else than the signum of f uh, u0 times xi. So if I plug in, let me give this maybe another color. If I plug in this guy for the signum of z, I can rewrite this equation. following way I just I just delete this one here I get the real value of ah, so now the, the green part is not visible anymore sorry I plug in for signum the signum of f of u0 times xi times f of u0 of xi, complex conjugate. So, but this is now nothing else than the absolute value of uh, f of u0 of xi. So why is that? Well, this is just, um, this is just what, we, what we get from this decomposition here. So, uh, rewriting this gives us 1 plus lambda x squared x minus, and then, well, we can just rewrite it shortly as f of u0 of xi. Okay, and we still want this to be equal to 0. And, well, now we are almost at our goal. So, we can now resolve for the value of x that we uh, that we are looking for because we want this to be zero. So resolving resolving this equation for x. So this is just basic algebra gives us absolute value of f u zero of xi divided by one plus lambda xi squared. Ah, so this is always a number that is different from different from zero because well lambda is always greater than zero. So division here is not a problem at all. And um, yeah, with this, so what was x? By definition, this was just the absolute value of z. And if we scroll back to what we wanted to do is we wanted to define f of u prime of xi we wanted this one to to define it via the complex number z in c that minimizes this expression so 
this should just be the z that we just calculated, which is nothing else by the decomposition, the absolute value of z times the signum of z. This is just the decomposition that we used here below. And now we plug in everything that we have calculated so far. So the absolute value of z was nothing else than f of uh, u0 times xi absolute value divided by 1 plus lambda xi squared times the signum of z, which I think um, was also given in the exercise. So just the signum of f of u0 of xi. And now using once again the definition of the complex signum function, this gives us f of u0 of xi divided by 1 plus lambda psi squared. So lengthy calculation, I have to admit. But now we have defined the Fourier transform of the function u star that we are looking at via, well, taking the Fourier transform of our original image u0 and dividing it by 1 plus lambda psi squared. So we are almost done. The only thing that, uh, well, that is missing to do is, well, we are still looking for a u star. We just have defined its Fourier transform. So we now need to transform back, and this is what uh, the part D of the exercise um, well, is precisely asking us to do. So we are looking for um, u star. Therefore, we take the inverse Fourier transform of what we just calculated here. Yeah? So we take the inverse Fourier transform here, which means we need to take the inverse Fourier transform at the um, other part of the equation. And um, yeah, so I have given you here a little bit of help, although it looks very complicated. Um, the hint is there, or this, well, not, not the hint, but the, this tool is here for you to see it's very easy to calculate the uh, inverse Fourier transform because it's already given. So um, summing up what we get, we take the inverse, so you, u star at position x will be nothing else than the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of u prime uh, of u star at position x. Um, and this one we can just define by uh, taking the inverse Fourier transform of um, well this product of functions f u zero with one over one plus lambda psi squared. So this is almost what we have here. So there is something that we still need to add, which is the prefactor of 2 pi minus d halves. Also here, a 2 pi of to the d halves. And what we should get then from the convolution theorem is that this is nothing else than taking the convolution with the kernel p lambda that is given here in the exercise with our original image u0 at position x. So, and this is once again a very nice result because it tells us that in order to minimize this functional, let me scroll up to the original problem here, in order to minimize this functional, given an original image u0, only thing that we need to do, and we have now verified it, um, very concretely, we need to take the convolution of u0 with this function p lambda, which is a Bessel function. Yeah, these, those functions always come up once you have uh, partial differential equations and are looking for uh, solutions of it. And this is something that we already should feel familiar with, knowing that the solution to the heat equation also comes from a kernel which was um, the, Gaussian, the Gaussian kernel in the case of the, of the heat equation. And now uh, we still don't know which equation um, we are solving, 
um, we will take a look at this in a different exercise, but at least the solution to this variational problem is also given via the convolution operator. So thank you for today. This was all that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm.